blank slot. Uh, so welcome, Nassim, for verification code for the attack. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Frank said, this is a short paper, so I kept my presentation also short. But uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, so actually, the, I'm Nasser Memon uh, from NYU. And uh, the work was mostly done by my students, Hussein and Thurn. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't make it. And I had the pleasure to visit Cambridge instead of them. Uh, so, I guess the previous talk was, uh, uh, or the discussion at least, was a good segue into what I'll talk about uh, uh, now, is that we all know and we've seen many uh, large service providers use uh, SMS as sort of a second channel or a second factor to uh, strengthen password security or in circumstances, for example, for password recovery, right? So when you've forgotten your password, uh, Gmail, for example, and you have a phone, mobile phone registered, it would send you a verification code through that, uh, to that mobile phone, which you enter, and thereby uh, you can reset your password. Uh, it's also used sometimes, and there are, uh, so that's one kind of situation where it's used, where there was a shared secret, the shared secret is lost, and now using a second channel somehow to recover that shared secret. And there are many ways of doing it. SMS is one. Uh, another, way, another situation where this can be done at times is where you're not certain about uh, the, the authentication process uh, because maybe, say, the IP address has changed. Suddenly, the person is now authenticating from Timbuktu or wherever, and has never done that before. So you say, "Give me more, uh, give me more." So certain systems could then say, "Okay, uh, I'll send you an SMS on your phone and verification code provided." So again, through a different channel. So assuming that the attacker to circumvent this will have to compromise both the channels, right? Uh, and then sometimes for account creation as well, I, I remember being in one country, I forget which one, where they tend to be watch the people more closely, I guess. And I was, uh, one of the, uh, the airport had free Wi-Fi. And I said, OK, I connected. It asked for my phone number. I gave it. And then it sent me a verification code to the phone number, which I had to enter. So now thereby it's binding my identity uh, to this phone number. So later on. If there's some reason they need to come after me, at least they know my phone number. So, so there are various situations in which this second channel or second factor, whatever you call it, is used. And the, basically, the assumption is that both the channels need to be compromised. And hence, it's a bigger hurdle for an attacker. And, and this is very old, right? It just has been analyzed for more than a decade now, I think, or roughly a decade. And people have looked at it and, and even talked about how this could be circumvented if you have malware in the device and you do, and depend, depending on how things were done, uh, do a man in the middle attack, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not a silver bullet, it's, but it sort of, it's being used by very large service providers even today. Shows that it has some value and, and uh, provides some additional measures of security uh, for purposes of authentication. So how do I move this forward? So we said that, OK, uh, this, you may have to, if you have malware on the, on the user's mobile, or if you're able to launch a man in the middle in, in certain situations, then you can uh, perhaps circumvent this. But what if you simply ask the user politely? Uh, will the user be kind enough just to give it to you? Uh, it turns out it appears to be yes. Uh, and that's why there's a short paper. We have a sort of a pilot study that, that we did. So essentially what you do is you go to Gmail, you go to type in the username and say, I forgot the password. And I'm assuming you know the phone number of this person. right? And what happens then is that this person, because they asked for a reset, they will out of the blue, some, because they didn't ask for a reset, because the reset was asked for on their account, uh, suddenly out of the blue, they will get 
an SMS message saying your verification code is something, 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 right? And they look at it and who knows what they'll do. Don't know. Uh, but pretty soon after that, because we know that they've just received an SMS because we reset the account, we send them a message and this is just an example in some way, sort of coaxing them, uh, asking them to, to send that code to us. So we say, please verify that your phone is associated with your account by replying with the code that just, we just sent to you. And will they type it in and send it to us? If they do, then I take it and now I have access to that email account, right? So that was our hypothetical scenario. And we wanted to check if, if this kind of works out. So we kind of, the goal of, so we did a small pilot study. Uh, uh, and that's why I say it appears that people will fall for it because the study was small. Uh, kind of a proof of concept, does this work? Uh, and if it works, like if I ask 100 people roughly how many will, will give me the code, obviously not all of them would. I think I, I would not, I don't know, depend, depending on the context and how much uh, I drank that night or whatever, you never know what you do. Uh, but the, in, in, in things like phishing, for example, there are studies done and companies regularly fish their employees and, and uh, it's known that a 15% response rate is apparently pretty decent. Uh, the CIO feels that, okay, only 15% re responded, you're doing a reasonable job. Uh, and I have some very large company CIOs have, have told me that they are somewhere between 20 and 25 and they're working on it. So, so our question was like, would we be still, we would, would we fall in the same kind of range? And also wanted to get an understanding of if they forward, why are they doing this? What is going on in their mind, right? So we did a small, attack, a small study where we basically did this SMS attack with 20 users. Uh, and uh, we made sure that these users all had uh, the two-factor authentication turned on in Gmail. So they were familiar with this thing, that it was not something strange to them uh, to make it sort of a bit valid. Uh, and then, we called 10 of them personally because this was done within the school itself. These were people we kind of knew uh, because we had to know their phone number. And then we called them personally and sat down with them and chatted with them a little bit to figure out what was it, how did they interpret this whole thing, what was going on in their mind. Uh, and then we did a slightly larger study where we sort of simulated this over MTurk, Mechanical Turk, with about 100 users, asking them kind of a role-playing scenario kind of thing. What would you do if you got this message kind of a thing? Right. Uh, so essentially, we got two numbers, Palo Alto numbers, starting with 650. I mean, that again probably was not important. Who knows that? Most people probably don't know that Palo Alto number is 650. It starts with that. Uh, and sent these two messages, right, in within 30 seconds. The first message we send the users, your Google verification code is, and send them a six-digit random number. And then within 30 seconds, we said, please verify that your phone is still associated with your Gmail account by replying this message with the code we have just sent for you. And what happened? Uh, lo and behold, about five out of the 20 responded back, right? So again, this is a very small, size, so don't take these percentages uh, to mean much at this point. But the fact that they fall in the same range as fishing sort of experiments tend to uh, give us some, kind of gave some credence to, to this whole thing. That, yeah, about 25% of the people did respond back and gave us their code. So we kind of called them and uh, we sort of had a short interview. Again, this was, uh, since it was a small study and, and we were just exploring uh, what's going on out here uh, before we did a, very, a larger, more principled study, uh, we kind of asked them about the reasons for enabling the 2FA, that they have 2FA, why do you do it? And they basically, most of the time, they were talking, saying that they do it because they tend to read the Gmail from 
untrusted computers uh, from labs or, or, or that's computers that they don't own themselves. And which is kind of a bit strange because when you're doing that and there's malware and stuff, there's other sort of problems that, they're, <laughs> that they have to deal with. The 2FA really may not help them. Uh, and then we also ask them if they notice these phone numbers when they get, like what phone number did it come from? Uh, and uh, whether they sort of have in their mind uh, some sense of it, is it the right number or this is a strange number or something of that sort. Um, and what did they think of the message? Did they think it was it from Google uh, that they did not ask for a verification code, they just got one un unwanted and why did they forward it, right? And whether they even mentally thought that such an attack was possible, whether, whether they kind of, whether such a scenario of somebody kind of faking it uh, ever entered their mind, right? Uh, so the, the paper, although the, we submitted a short paper, so it's, uh, but I have a longer version as well, uh, gives more details about what, what uh, uh, these subjects kind of said, but uh, of course, very expected, seven of them, seven out of ten didn't even look at the numbers, right? Uh, there were some who saw that the code, the code came from one number and the request for the code came from another number, so they uh, were suspicious, right? Of course, these numbers can be spoofed, but again, these special numbers that uh, you get SMSs on, those eight-digit numbers, four hyphen four or something of that sort, uh, I, I don't know how easily those can be spoofed. Uh, and and they just, because it was Google asking and because they were very fearful of losing their email, because email is something they want, and this email, this thing is saying, hey, uh, we need to know the code to continue your email or something of that kind, they, they just forwarded it. That was kind of the main uh, thinking that we uh, encountered when we were talking to people who actually forwarded. They, they had this fear of losing their Gmail account, which they didn't want to. And, and uh, so, so then we did a larger study with a uh, hundred sort of MTUG people, and again, I said this was more of a role-playing scenario. They didn't, we didn't actually send anything to their phone because an MTUG, we, we don't know their phone numbers. We can't ask them for phone numbers, right? Uh, so we don't know their phone numbers in order to fish them. Uh, and so the result was, again, roughly similar. Uh, about 22% uh, said that they would uh, uh, forward the code. And so, so again, the, the results from MTurk and, and, and the mot motivations, et cetera, what we found were, were roughly uh, similar. So why, why is this happening, right? Um, so, and first, the user is not able to verify, right? And this happens in most of these remote communications, that the user has no means of knowing that this is actually coming from the claimed uh, sender, right? I don't have any way to know that this is coming from Google. Uh, for emails and things of that sort, you can maybe carefully look at, look at the email address, but well, naive grandma, grandpa, they, they probably may not understand that, right? You and me. Could. So there's always a small number of people who really have no very simple brain dead means of being able to tell that yes, this is indeed the sender. Right? Uh, and then there is a lack of context, right? Uh, suddenly you get something out of the blue, uh, and all the message simply says, "This is your verification code." Like for what? What happened? Uh, it doesn't really say anything at all, uh, which makes, again, raises the possibility of then ask, getting that code from, from the recipient, right? Because they received it without any sort of context. And also, when we design these systems as computer scientists, et cetera, we think of, oh, we think of users as, as someone like who will think like us, but why should they? Uh, they why, why should grandma and grandpa think about these things or worry about these things, and if they don't, is it their fault? I, I don't know. 
uh, I would I would say not, right? You have to design things such that it works without knowledge of these things, uh, or with minimum as as low as possible, right? And then there is this trust with association in the sense you had this Google message come in and the next message coming in immediately, so you kind of trust it because you just got a message from Google and you associate the second message with the first. Right? So these kind of four phenomena are happening, we believe. So how could this be fixed? fixed? Uh, maybe the message could be different. Uh, Maybe you could say, do not forward this message, for example. Uh, do not forward this code under any circumstance. And we currently, we're doing a, a larger, more principled experiment. Turns out that this do not forward business doesn't work. Uh, there are some people who still will forward. <laughs> they, they tend to ignore it. But they'll be looking at other types of, sort of signals that could alert them and uh, uh, perhaps uh, maybe the message would say, hey, someone tried to reset your password, and if so, otherwise ignore. Well, then now it uh, puts it in better sort of context. But then of, case, of course, it's SMS. SMS, there's 140 characters, uh, so there's only so much you can say. Uh, or maybe there needs to be some naming system, I don't know. Uh, I'm just thinking out wild at this point, uh, that perhaps uh, like when you have domain names, when you get these phone numbers, you have no idea who these phone, the phone numbers, uh, phone, uh, who's behind those phone numbers, right? There's no sort of naming system that we have. Or there could be a whitelist of some sort, uh, which we know that these are the numbers that, but how practical they are, et cetera, I, I don't know yet. Uh, or adding some security indicators and phishing sort of uh, to alleviate or reduce instances of phishing, people have looked at adding indicators, and perhaps there's some indicators that could be added here that could help. Uh, so, so currently, we are looking at these kinds of issues, and, uh, but it was interesting that uh, people would give you the verification code just by asking. I mean, uh, it doesn't take more. You don't need to hack them. You don't need to do man in the middle. Just ask them, and they'll give it to you. So that's it. Thank you.